<clears throat> this is this is something that has fascinated me uh, for years. I guess mainly as a psychologist, I really, I, I don't know if I can say I enjoy, but my curiosity drives me. I like to find people who are really different from me and see if I can understand how they think about things. And this is an example, I think we've already chatted a little bit in our, uh, before we, we started formally here, uh, in talking about how people seem to have these cockamamie ideas about vaccination or about uh, you know beliefs in religion or, or politics. And we wonder how did they get to that point? <clears throat> uh, in a sense, defying what we know as fact in many of those cases. And, and so that's part of what has driven me to, to look at anti-vaxxers. Uh, uh, so that's what I wanna share with you. Uh, give me just a minute here while, while I share the screen. Um, let's see. And I'm also gonna share computer sound Oops. Here we go. Uh, can everyone see this? Okay, very good. <clears throat> the, the theme of I don't believe it is, is what I chose as the title here because it's a phrase that I've heard again and again from people when I talk with them about COVID and I talk with them about um, some of the political things that are going on. And they simply say, I, I don't believe these epidemiologists or I don't believe these physicians or pharmacists or I don't believe Democrats or whatever it happens to be. There's this mental screen that they have that they just don't let things through. And I'm, I'm fascinated about how they develop that, that approach to, to information. Now, uh, this slide presentation, I sent it to David Cole just a while ago in a PDF form. Uh, and all of you are welcome to download that. I'm not, I'm not sure how David sets that up, uh, but you're welcome to have the whole presentation. And if any of you like to follow up with conversations, you can reach me through my CSS uh, email, dswenson at css.edu. Well, what I'd like to talk about is to, to briefly uh, describe how viruses work. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that, some not. So I want to at least have that as a backdrop and a very brief uh, uh, discussion of, of the history of vaccination, how that works. Then I want to go into much more detail on what the drivers are for this idea of anti-vaccination or vaccination uh, hesitancy. Um, what personality factors and beliefs, and especially focusing on social media, seems to be uh, influencing that. And then we'll conclude with communicating with the anti-vaxxers and, and uh, anti-vaccination hesitant people, what works and what doesn't work. The logical thing we would do would be to challenge them outright, but generally that makes them more defensive. We feel pretty good about it, but it really doesn't make a change. And so we are beginning to find out uh, when we're talking with conspiracy theorists and anti-vaxxers and people who have that kind of logic type compartmentalization, what works and what doesn't work and maybe creating some cracks in that shell that they have. And then I'm looking forward to having some discussion, not necessarily question and answer, because I think we have a lot of expertise among us, but having more of a discussion about some of the, some of the things that, that I'll be presenting here. As, as we look at this chart, it's, it's humbling and amazing and almost overwhelming to realize that, that we have these numbers of people getting sick and dying from COVID. And in the beginning, the idea of having waves of contagion was something people were poo-pooing, and now it looks like we're surfing. We've got so many different waves. But again, it's amazing to find this number of people, our neighbors, our friends, people we know of, prominent people in, in, in the nation coming down with COVID, many of them dying, and people are still denying that or saying it's a hoax or it's not that serious or we're being taken advantage of. And it's fascinating to see facts. <clears throat> and on the other hand, people simply denying that that's the case. So what I'd like to, uh, to do is to, uh, let me get back to yeah, um, here we go. And what we see actually are people who are in such denial that they'll go to bars and restaurants and political rallies. They ignore this idea of social distancing. They aren't wearing masks. They're singing, they're cheering, they're, they're in close proximity with 
people they know, people they love, as well as strangers. And then from this kind of contagion, they go out back to their families, back to their workplace, and they shed viruses. Um, and they continue to do it despite all the information that we, we see in, in news and, and healthcare media, <clears throat> that this is a bad thing to do. I kind of like this quote from Isaac Asimov. There's a cult of ignorance in the United States, and there always has been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. My ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. And that's going to be a theme that I'll even be concluding with, with some scientific evidence of, of what this is as a thinking style. Um, I could describe a lot about viruses, but I actually found a really good uh, two minute video that has a lot of graphics that I think does a better job than I can do. So I want to switch to that right now. <clears throat> Let me see if I can do that. Vi okay, are you seeing this, uh, this video? Viruses, they're everywhere. Are you seeing that? Nope, not yet. Okay, let me uh, see if I can go back and reshare that. Here we go. They're everywhere. They come in different sizes and shapes, yet all are very small. How small? Well, if a person was the size of a flu virus, they and almost half of the world's human population could fit on top of a pencil eraser. Yep, that's pretty small. Even when we get a good look at viruses, they are tricky to peg. They mutate and evolve at different speeds. Viruses have to replicate quickly and spread to as many host cells as possible before your immune system stops them. And spreading between hosts is pretty easy. It happens a lot of ways. The most common, good old fashioned sternutation or sneezing. Like it or not, many of us ingest and inhale millions of viruses every day. Usually we're fine, but sometimes we get sick. Take for example, influenza. The flu virus covered in little spikes travels towards a host cell. These spikes attach to the receptors on the cell's surface. Once latched on, the virus is granted entry through the cell's membrane. The virus wastes no time releasing its genetic material into the cell. This hijacks the cell's reproductive system, forcing it to make millions of virus copies that leave the cell and spread to other parts of the host. To take command of a cell, the virus needs to be strong, but not so strong as to damage the cell's ability to function. It's a delicate dance for the constantly mutating virus. There's always a chance that a random mutation may help it survive. So our bodies put up a defense, which is aided by vaccines. The virus mutations require new flu vaccines to be developed every year. But okay. <clears throat> that gives you, I, I think, a pretty good example of, of how viruses work, the way they invade the cell, the way that they replicate, and the way that vaccines uh, block that. There we go. Can you see this slide of Edward Jenner? Okay. Uh, the history of vaccination really goes back quite a long way. There's a history in China, but it's, it's not altogether clear that they probably preceded this idea of vaccination by several hundred years, as is often the case with China. But in um, uh, the uh, late 1700s, Edward Jenner, a physician, began noticing that milkmaids who were milking the cows often got cowpox, uh, a, a very small pustule that was very, um, it wasn't very debilitating. They'd get over it quickly, but they also did not catch smallpox at the time. 
And through his reasoning, he thought maybe catching this light version of a pox, if people could be vaccinated or scratch on the skin, have it go into your system, maybe that would help resist smallpox. And so he, he got the eight-year-old son of his gardener to volunteer for it. This would never go over today. And he vaccinated this youngster uh, with uh, cowpox, and the youngster did not get smallpox. And that was kind of the beginning of thinking about how can we protect ourselves against these incredibly virulent, dangerous diseases. But even back then, he was met with a huge backlash. There were a lot of religious people who said, you know, if people catch a disease and die, it's God's will. And for you to try to change that is blasphemy. And they were as threatening and aggressive with him as we, as we see today. There are also a lot of people who said, it's my individual choice. It's my individual freedom. I don't have to get a vaccination. I don't want it. <clears throat> this idea of collective responsibility is not my responsibility. And perhaps even worse, there were some people with, with white and financial privilege who said, you know, if, if the children of the poor are killed with this virus, that just calls them out. We don't want to be overrun with poor people anyway. And then finally, uh, also matching many of the beliefs people have today is, you know, this, this vaccine may do something terrible to me. And back then they said, well, if you're getting this from, from cattle and vaccinating people with cattle, maybe what's going to happen is we'll start taking on the characteristics of cattle. And in fact, there was a, a drawing here where people were growing horns and their tongues were coming out like cattle tongues. And they had, um, they had cattle coming out of their backside and all sorts of strange things. But this is how bizarre it was that people will develop cow traits if they were vaccinated. And it's very similar to, to the unusual beliefs that people have now about vaccination. Basically, a vaccination is when you take a weakened form of whatever that disease entity is and you inject that weakened form into the body so the body can produce antibodies. And when it produces antibodies at any future time that those particular bugs enter the body, then your body is prepared to, uh, to capture them or neutralize them or kill them. That's basically how it works, not rocket science. Well, we've heard a lot about herd immunity and the idea is that when you have a large population that isn't vaccinated, then you obviously are going to have some kind of a condition that is going to be rapidly spread throughout that population. <clears throat> and it can spread very fast or slowly, depending on how virulent that disease is. If you vaccinate a small portion of that population, you're going to have a small portion of the people who are immunized, but because other people are not and they still have contact with each other, that's still going to spread through the population. It's only when you have most of the people in a population immunized, and some people will still catch the disease, but because as a host, they don't have contact with other people who are not immunized, or at least not with many others, most of the population is, it's simply not going to spread. Now, the idea of, of uh, herd immunity, um, it, it varies. Uh, some people say it's only, you need 50%. Some people say it's 90%. It seems to depend on the level of contagion, but there's not a lot of consensus about what that magic number is. The catch is that when people say, well, let's go ahead and let, let everybody catch the disease. What the heck? You know, people are going to die. Everyone dies. Let's just go ahead and let the population catch it. Well, in a, our current population of about 330 million people, the percentage of death, you know, our different sources were estimating that. Some people say, well, it's less than 1%. Some people say, well, it could be as high as 2.7%. So I picked just 1%. That 1%, that's 3.3 million deaths. Those are our family members, people we know, neighbors, people who run businesses that are going to go kaput because their, their ownership is, uh, is out of commission. It's going to continue to damage the economy and our society. Look at what the implication is if we simply try to let it run wild. We cannot do that. Now, let's switch thinking for a minute here. Let's imagine that, and I know many of us are parents, but as parents, you know, we're concerned about our kids. And so we've heard this idea that immunizations in check, uh, inject just a little bit of a weakened virus. Okay, well, that's not bad. But when you look at this, look at all these immunizations from birth to six years old, holy cow, they're getting immunization after immunization after immunization. Is it possible that there's a buildup of all these weakened ones? 
if you give somebody one shot of a week, you know, maybe that's okay, but you start giving multiple shots, does that weaken the immune system? Does that increase the, um, uh, the strength of some of these different strains? I mean, I can understand how parents would be concerned about that. Does that make sense to you? And you look at all these different ones and say, yeah, that is a lot of injections. Well, let's take autism. Now notice down in the lower left-hand corner in the 1970s, I was in my doctoral program in 1970s. And at that time, it was estimated that about one in every 10,000 children would, would develop autism. In fact, it was so rare at that time that in none of my classes on diagnostics or on treatment did we really cover autism, hardly at all. It was only uh, in uh, classes in another program on special education that they talked about, because that's primarily what, what they would treat in some very limited ways. We just didn't talk about it then. But look at that curve. Look at that curve. two years ago, one out of every 59 children are diagnosed with autism. So we're going from one in 10,000 to one in 59. Are you crazy? What is going on here? And in fact, it's one per 37 boys and one per, per 151 girls. Boys usually are diagnosed with it more than girls. What is going on there? It could be those doggone vaccines, couldn't it? But you know, what they fail to consider is that there are often a lot of other explanations. One, if you stop anybody on the street and you say, what do you, have you heard about autism? What do you know about that? Most people are gonna be able to tell you there's much greater awareness of autism now, and we have better diagnostic screening tools. The problem is, if you answer one or two of those questions as a yes, does that mean you have autism? Or does it take three or four? Where's the cutoff? And I'm a, uh, as a clinician, I supervise uh, a lot of uh, therapists for licensure. I consult with day treatment and diagnostic centers and residential treatment centers. And we, we often, in fact, regularly, we get psychological evaluations from other practitioners who've done psychological testing. They come up with a diagnosis. They have autism in, as one of the diagnoses. And I, I uh, look at, at the therapists I'm working with who are bright, good people, and they say, I don't see any of these behaviors. I don't see autism at all. Maybe somebody's a little introverted, but not to the point where an introversion alone is not diagnostic of autism. And so we refer to those as kind of a drive-by diagnosis. Insurance companies in your first session require you to have a working diagnosis and far, far, far too often that just continues with, with the client. So we have these diagnostic screening tools to give people, you know, a weapon and you go around or a hammer, let's say, and everything looks like a nail. Uh, we also have moved from the idea that autism is a discrete condition to it's a continuum. And I, I think there's some utility in that, too. But now we have a spectrum. And therefore, we're going to diagnose early conditions. We're going to call it autism, as well as those that are really profound, where a person needs ongoing 24-7 personal care. They're misdiagnoses. To some extent, they're changing diagnostic criteria. And we don't know what, what environmental influences are. People talk about everything from radio waves to pollution. We, we just don't know about that stuff. My point here is that there are a lot of different explanations the other problem is that this guy, Dr. Andrew Wakefield in 1998, did a really interesting study. He got a group of kids and he found a relationship between MMR, uh, measles and uh, mumps and rubella. Um, and um, he said that, that these early MMR vaccines can produce autism. And boy, did this fall on ears that were ready to hear this kind of thing. <clears throat> and after he got published in The Lancet, which is a, a prestigious medical journal, then he went even further and he says, there is a causal association here. And so people jumped on the bandwagon, as you can see in some of these uh, newspaper articles and, and some of the, uh, the public uh, to do about it. And that sounds pretty interesting, except his sample size was only 12 children. They were not randomly selected from a population of kids who presented different behaviors, but they were family referred. There was no control group. It wasn't double blinded. The data collection was unsystematic. It was incomplete for only 12 children. 
and they didn't consider any other biological uh, mechanism as we just talked about for autism. There was no causal link established. It was correlational. And even then, you can't correlate such a small number. The other thing that was discovered is that Wakefield was financially involved with an attorney, and that attorney was representing an anti-vaccine lawsuit. Well, they started digging a little bit deeper and they found out that there were so many biases and falsification of data that the Lancet retracted the study. 10 of his 12 co-authors bailed out and he lost his medical license for fraud. Well, the damage had already been done. The information was out there. Here were all these parents who said, you know, this is a doctor. He knows he's done a study. There's evidence. And so we're not going to have our kids risk. It's just not worth the risk to have them vaccinated. Well, this idea of correlate does not mean causation. Here's an example, for example, or here's an example. <clears throat> you can see the autism curve from 1998 to about 2007. Holy cow, look at that. Organic food sales. That matches that. Correlation means it's co-related. Two things have the same curve of change. When one changes, the other changes. It simply shows that they follow the same pattern. It doesn't mean they have a common cause. If they did, it means we should really get rid of organic food sales because that causes autism. But they weren't willing to consider that. Well, in uh, 1993, triple vaccines, MMR, were, were essentially stopped and separated. But this didn't have any effect on autism. The yellow line coming down is the MMR vaccination, the triple vaccination that came down. By 1992, it, it pretty much was absent. But look at that blue line, which is uh, all uh, uh, autism spectrum disorders. It continued to, to increase. So it obviously does not cause, cause autism, but that doesn't mean anything to people who already made up their mind because they're not listening to this. They're listening to an echo chamber of other people who believe it. I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, to give you an idea how far this has gone, in Great Britain, people stopped vaccinating their dogs because they believe vaccinations would cause their dogs to have autism. And finally, the British Veterinary Association said, um, dogs don't get autism. Don't worry about it. Get them vaccinated. Well, the consequences of that is that many public officials and epidemiologists and physicians and politicians and other people who encourage people to get vaccinations, they got a lot of nasty emails, threatening emails, death threats, abusive phone calls, the kinds of things that we've seen in this political campaign with governors being threatened. Um, in the UK, confidence in the MMR vaccine just bottomed out. Uh, in the United States, there was a 5% reduction in MMR vaccination coverage and a threefold increase in measles cases, costing about $2.1 million for public sector. Most interesting, in uh, 2014, there was a record number of cases, 667 cases of measles in 27 states, compared with only 55 cases two years before that. And we continue to see those, those, uh, those spikes in measles. And, you know, Jim, you brought up um, uh, early on, we forget, most of us who are old, older, Ooh. we remember back in the 1950s, uh, a lot of these diseases. Younger people have not, don't have this, this, this memory. You know, we remember seeing the scars of people from smallpox, those who survived it. Uh, we remember hearing stories about people who had tetanus and the awful contractures they experienced, the painful contractures and agony before they died. Consumption that would consume the body with tuberculosis, uh, which is still rampant in many parts of the world. Uh, measles, which can result in hearing and visual deficits. I did have the measles as a youngster, and I remember uh, my parents closing all the blinds because they didn't want to have bright light, which apparently then would, uh, would affect your eyesight with measles. I got through it okay. Diphtheria, before vaccinations, 50% of people who were not vaccinated died, and afterwards, 5 to 10% had, had mortality. Now, this is interesting, too, because nothing is perfect for people who say, well, I want to guarantee that my son's not going to come down with something. We don't do that. We are always comparing the benefit of the treatment with the possible side effects. And it, 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 it's kind of a balance. But in cases with serious diseases, the benefits far, far outweigh the risks. And as we have more experience, we can identify more who might be at risk for that. 
from the 1950s, I remember, and many of you remember too, and Jim, you mentioned that, um, the, um, the iron lungs that people had because the respiratory system was failing, the musculature was failing and they were suffocating. So they lived out much of their lives in these, in these wards of iron lungs. And years after that, you would see kids uh, walking around and adults with pencil thin legs because the motor neurons had been destroyed by polio and they walked with, with braces. And then salt came out with the vaccine and we don't have polio. The eradication of diseases such as sm smallpox uh, is something that has been accomplished only through vaccinations. And it works. I found this online. I thought this is, this is a, a horrible and a wonderful photograph of what happens when someone is, is and is not vaccinated. And the smallpox exposure dropped from 90% to 5%. And in the 1970s, it dropped from several hundred thousand to eradication. We have eradicated smallpox, except for those governments, including our own, that continue having it in their, their, their CBW, chemical biological uh, warfare um, uh, research centers, because we've got to be ready in case somebody else releases it. So we still have it there, but otherwise it seemed to be pretty much eradicated but vaccination works. Here's another example of that. We're looking at everything from diphtheria and polio and pertussis, which is whooping cough, uh, measles, hepatitis A and B and so on. The big blue circle is um, the number of reported cases up to about 700,000. And then there's smaller blue in within that, but the blue refers to the number of cases that are reported. And then you see that orange circle and that's when vaccine was finally licensed and implemented for use. And following that, you can see the smaller and smaller blue circles again of the effectiveness of the vaccine. It's never 100%, but boy, does it knock down those numbers. Well, in 2019, you can see again that measles cases shot through the roof. Um, there was a Jewish community in New York of Orthodox Jews. There was another one of, of um, uh, domestic families in upstate California, another one in Oregon, that simply believe that, no, we're not going to do it. And that accounts for many of those cases. People, if they have beliefs, they believe that's sufficient not to be vaccinated. So I went through the literature and I'm, I've tried to characterize as much as possible who is more likely to be hesitant about vaccines. Now, uh, it's not all Republicans. In fact, there are some Democrats, as I'll be showing a little bit later, uh, who also are vaccine reluctant. But I'm, I'm talking on average here, Republicans and populists tend to be more hesitant about vaccines than Democrats and independents. People who hold unconventional and conspiratorial beliefs are also people much more hesitant because they believe there's something behind this vaccination plot. Um, Non-white people than white people, if you think of, of all the terrible experiments that went on with, um, especially with uh, African-American people, the Tuskegee experiments and some of the others, uh, you, you don't blame for mistrusting the government. Uh, rural and farm residents, in many cases, they are listening to um, their parochial friends who have these very conservative beliefs. They don't have internet access. On the other hand, in many cases, you find in city and urban residents, they have internet access, but they have listened primarily to those uh, social media sources against vaccination. So it, it's kind of polarized there. Uh, you can have people without much education and also well-educated people who believe in, in this anti-vax stuff. It's very interesting, and very polarized. People who have privileged high income, and that may be because of their economic beliefs. You know, um, if we deny that this stuff is going on, then we're not going to have to shut our businesses down. I'm not sure about that, but that seems to be the, the thread that's there. If you have uh, very close social groups and most of your friends uh, have these kinds of beliefs, you're going to be more accommodating to those. If you're worried and overprotective as a parent, you're going to be more conservative. It makes sense. And if you are kind of a conspiratorial person, say there's a pharmaceutical industrial complex that's trying to run our lives and they're just run by greed and power, then let's not fall in line with them. There's, there's, there's some kind of a plot behind this stuff. Now, what I want to emphasize is that people who are vaccine hesitant and even some who are true extreme anti-vaxxers, these are not bad people. 
they are people like many of our family members. I would guess some of us have family members or relatives who have opposite beliefs we do. They may be our neighbors. They may be fine, bright, well-motivated, hardworking people. And they have this belief system that's very different from ours and one that we frankly think may be destructive. But I don't want to vilify these people. In fact, if we do that, that's going to keep us from communicating with them in ways that may help them see a broader view. So I want to emphasize that. Uh, there is a lot of overlap between conspiracy theories and the anti-vaxxers. I did not want to repeat that presentation I did in 2018, but for any of you who are interested in that overlap, and particularly the psychology of conspiracy theories, um, I, I think you still probably have available online my previous presentation uh, on the psychology of conspiracy theories. In that, I talked about what are the preconditions that kind of predispose people to conspiracy, what are their motives, personality factors, cognitive factors, and social reinforcement. So I'm not going to cover that. I am going to emphasize a little more of the social reinforcement factors in this presentation, because I think that's really instrumental in manipulating our neighbors, family members, and others to kind of buy what we see as really a cockamamie and very limited idea. <clears throat> Here's a little bit more on the differences between Democrats and Republicans. Starting on the upper left and working across and, and uh, down, uh, if you look at who is more worried about it, well, obviously Democrats are more worried about COVID than, than most Republicans are. Social distancing, yeah, we're the ones who do that more than Republicans are. You look at the political rallies and you have to really search for anyone wearing a mask. In terms of social, uh, social isolation, like we are right now, we're, we're, we're here, we're working from home, um, but many Republicans don't do that. How many of us wear masks? Same kind of thing. How many who may have been exposed are going to go ahead and go to their workplace? Republicans more than Democrats. And how much of us expect some kind of disruption of our social life and our economic life? As Democrats and independents, we tend to be more aware of that and think that's going to happen, whereas there's a lot of denial, uh, especially during 2020 uh, with Republicans. But it is not just a, a Republican and Democrat thing. I thought I, I was surprised by this one. Uh, along the bottom line are um, different income levels and the vertical axis is the degree to which people believe that they should be exempt based on their beliefs. Well, the beliefs and the income level interact. That's what I think is so interesting. So for people who make less than maybe $90,000 a year, there's a pretty good difference between Republicans and Democrats. But look at this end over here. As you end up with people getting higher incomes, Democrats and Republicans are pretty similar in saying, if I just, you know, I believe that there's a risk to it, so I'm not going to do it. My belief is sufficient to give me an exemption. And that, that's fascinating. You know, the idea sometimes we say that extreme Republicans and extreme Democrats, it's kind of like a circle and they come together. I think that's kind of showing that here. Although I really don't know if it's privilege and income per se that's doing that. Uh, I've not seen a good explanation of this, but I, I think it's interesting. Maybe in our discussion, we can talk a little bit about that because I, I really don't know per se. Uh, social media is, is the area that I think probably is having the most, the most influence on that. And there's a big challenge with this. It's called misinformation when it's accidental. It's called disinformation when it's intentional. And in putting this presentation together, I, I, you know, again, being a child of the, of the 50s, uh, remember when we talked about propaganda? This really is kind of a propaganda war. It's not just you know, the, the Russians or the Chinese or the Iranians or somebody else trying to really mess up our, our country by getting us divided. It's also within the country that people want to maintain, I think, their, their power, their position, uh, their view of the world, and they are intentionally giving disinformation to people. And increasingly, we get a lot of our information from the internet, not from uh, the newspapers, not from the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Herald, uh, not from CNN, but from a lot of other kinds of social media. And these actually are called information bubbles. 
uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of kind of of, of um, popular terms. Information bubble is one of those. For example, right now, if I asked all of you to uh, to go to Google and type in uh, social media disinformation, or or let's say vaccination, let's do that uh, vaccination. Uh, we'd all come up with slightly different returns. If we had somebody who was really an anti-vaxxer, they would come up with completely different returns. And that's because most of these search engines look at what you're looking for and they want to serve you well. So they will give you more of what you're looking for. If you order stuff online at Amazon or Dayton's or something like that, every time you go back there, they'll say, hey, you might be interested in, and much of the time they're right. They know what you're looking for. They're going to give you more of it. And so the problem with social media is that it's going to give you more of what you're looking for that's self-reinforcing and you're not getting that opposite view that we really think we ought to have in a democratic society. So these information bubbles begin isolating us. And if you have information, somewhere between about 53 and maybe up to 78% of the people can tell whether it's a hoax or false information or misinformation. 50% is not very high. So even with bright, well-educated people, we may not be able to discern what's true and what's not true. Some of the social media sources are very clever, very much like propaganda. They will have legitimate news in there, and then they'll put in misinformation. And we're kind of accepting all of it. Oh, yeah, well, this makes sense, and this is true, and oops, there's something else that got slipped in there. Also, the, the lack of journalistic quality and ethics. You know, we have what are called citizen journalists now. I don't know about that term journalism because it used to mean something specific. People were trained in ethics, they were trained in fact finding, and now anybody who has an opinion can have their own blog, they can, they can uh, spout news out, and that's where we end up with this division between fact-based information, opinion, and outright crazy crap and quackery. Uh, some of the other things that I think make it understandable is that people who are really isolated and frustrated and especially fearful uh, are more easily influenced. When people are afraid, they want certainty. And Mr. What's-His-Name in the White House um, is one of the people who will give you absolute answers, even though nearly all of them are wrong. But people like that feeling of confidence and strength and somebody who's bucking the system because you can't trust the system. There's also what's called in psychology negativity effect. And <laughs> I was joking about it when, when we were talking a little about, you know, uh, uh, we've got a dinner group uh, that gets together. And one of us last time, we were all talking about all of our physical ills. Uh, in a sense, you know, what's wrong with this? What's the negative stuff? You know, uh, I have this, uh, you know, my ankles hurt, my back hurts. I've had this kind of an injury or something like that. Well, People share stories about harm and tragedy more than they do positive ones. You'll find kids on internet talking about all the exaggerated, wonderful things they've done. That's not realistic either, but with people who are a little bit older and people who are middle-aged, they talk about everything that's going wrong. I have a Friday beer group and we get on there and one of the first things that happens we have to control is we start complaining about everything that's going wrong in politics. That's true. But then that means we're also missing, where are we doing good stuff? How are we pulling out of this? So this negativity effect is our tendency to talk about negative stuff. And in fact, in terms of memory, we will remember negative things more than we will positive things. Uh, with social media too, you know, you hit that reply button and that's like our knee jerk reaction. And when we give a knee jerk reaction, we're usually not thinking it through. It's more of an impulsive and emotional reaction and it tends to be more exaggerated. When, when I teach marketing as well at, at the college, and in marketing, the, the major influence we have when we're searching for a new car, I mean, a lot of us are going to go to consumer reports, but we're also going to ask people we know, people we trust, and that word of mouth carries a lot of impact to it. And so a friend or a trusted source or someone like Fauci, uh, who we have respect for, that's going to influence us. And the accuracy of information is less important than our social connection or even the prestige we have in people saying, hey, that's really a neat idea. There's something called the third person effect, too, which has to do, you know, um, uh, one of my grandsons uh, it just turned 21 and uh, he's a combat medic and he is a, um, a firefighter. 
And I said, let me get this right. You're going to go out under fire, drag people off the line. You're going to go up in a perfectly good plane and you're going to jump out of it into a fire. Is that what I'm understanding? He said, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, there's a sense, and all of us probably remember when we were kids, Kids, there's this this invulnerability thing you know I want to do all these things and it's not going to happen to me and so this third person effect is where other people are affected by this stuff I'm not affected by it I'm not biased I think this stuff through pretty well and ultimately when we already have some premises some beliefs I kind of believe this we look for confer for confirmation so confirmation bias is something we do and if somebody says something else well they, they just don't know we tend to devalue their argument and maybe the source and finally, posts online are a way of getting a sense of identity. I was on this one listserv for a while, and this one guy would probably post, gosh, I think one time I noticed it was 24, 25 posts a day, never less than 10. And I was thinking, this guy must not have a life. He would have these long, long posts. Some of it was pretty good, but I was thinking, this guy must have his, you know, have his navel connected to his computer because he doesn't separate from it. But a lot of people get their sense of identity and belonging. When they make a lot of contributions, people begin to notice them. And you get this echo chamber that creates a new norm in what we're talking about. Um, the stories that people have too, stories have a lot more impact. Narratives have more impact than, than facts do. And as Facebook and Twitter and YouTube begin to hear back from all of us that, hey, we can't trust you anymore. They start doing fact checking. They really have started doing a pretty good job in restricting misinformation and disinformation. The downside of this, the unexpected consequences is now all these people who used to use Facebook and Twitter, and we would read that stuff and see how kind of crazy they are. Now they're going to their own platforms that are completely unmoderated and now they're really rolling. For example, there's one called Natural News Defending Health, Life and Liberty. Join our fight for human freedom, knowledge, and awakening. And others like Think Twice, the Global Vaccine Institute. There was a study done by the American Public Health Association just recently, and they identified 480 anti-vaccine websites that present themselves as news. 75 or 65 percent said vaccines outright were dangerous. 62 percent they cause autism. 41% cause permanent brain damage. I suspect using those websites uses causes permanent brain damage. 65% cited scientific evidence. So, you know, when we say, well, we have scientific evidence, I say, well, that's fake news. We have scientific evidence too. And they don't know how to read scientific evidence. I teach master's level people and I am amazed still both those who have are practitioners and those who are in graduate school, they don't know how to read research. They look at the title, the abstract, the conclusions, and they go with that without looking at the methodology that was used to derive that, that may actually be questionable. 30% uh, relied on patient and parent testimonials and 19% promoted alternative medicine to established uh, health uh, practices such as, as vaccine, vaccines. Um, one of my friends uh, in a conversation I had with him yesterday, he's a deputy director of health and human services and was in uh, Douglas County. Um, he was talking about some of these sites and how incredibly sexist and, race, and racist they are too, because they're completely unmoderated. So it's really become kind of an underground where people are going to find their beliefs reinforced. Another big source of this anti-vax are these prominent people, these celebrities. Look at these groups. I mean, Robert F. Kennedy, Bill Maher. That's surprising. A lot of us like Bill Maher because he's a good critical thinker. He challenges a lot of goofy ideas. But here he is. He also, he's also an anti-vaxxer. Where are the experts and the scientists in this? We're not using celebrities the way the other side is using celebrities and they're listening to these folks who are essentially uninformed. Now, this is kind of an interesting, interesting model. I wanted to use graphics here because it really, it really shows the impact of, of some of this. There's a procedure called social network analysis. And again, some of us who are older may have remembered when we were in maybe kindergarten or first grade, you were asked, who is your best friend? And it was a sociogram and it showed everybody in class and who you go to as a best friend. And so it showed those most popular kids in the middle, big dot, and it showed kids on the out, kind of on the fringe, who really weren't well connected, and people who were kind of a bridge person connecting everybody. 
Well, social network analysis in this case is who do you get information from about vaccination or about anything? And in, in um, modern techie language, they use bots and sock puppets. Those are the red dots here. And those are individual users or those are a single source such as a website or um, a blog that intentionally sends out a bombardment of information to a lot of people on the same information, but it happens to be false. And people say, hey, look, if I find this stuff everywhere, it must be true. And then there are these blue dots, and those are people who read that stuff, and they spread that false information. And so it's kind of like dropping an egg on the floor. It splatters all over the place. And you find people who say, gee, you know, I see it everywhere. It must be true. I'm going to tell my friend about it. Uh, hey, go to this website. Take a look at this stuff. And it's really hard to counter this because it, it's kind of like uh, that, that old Nazi thing. If you tell people a lie long enough, they begin believing it. And it's sort of the same thing. By the way, at the bottom of most of these slides, uh, I have the source for these. Uh, if you want to follow up on this information, I think it's, I think it's fascinating stuff. Now, here's, here's the result of it. Here's the damage that I think is done. Uh, in this particular case, it was uh, a study of um, how media polarizes groups on vaccinations. And you can see that by, by going to sources that reinforce what you want. In the middle here, there are very few bridge people. There are some, but not very many. And most people are going to gravitate. Uh, in this case, it was Republicans versus Democrats. They're going to gravitate toward people who share their common beliefs, including those about vaccination. And the same thing about, about Democrats. We really have become unhealthily polarized here. Uh, this one, by the way, I want to correct that. It was on the beef ban. It wasn't on vaccination, but it was related to, uh, to health care uh, and to some extent um, uh, viruses in, in beef. Well, the problem is, if we have these beliefs, then we're going to influence our legislators to, to respond to that. And the dark blue states here, the solid dark blue, are those where people have a religious exemption from immunizations. And those that are, are shaded are those where a person says, well, I don't have a religious belief, but I, I have a personal belief that, that vaccinations are dangerous, therefore, I, I can exempt myself from getting a vaccination. That's scary. Look at all the blue there where simply we're going to lose the battle. People are going to get vaccinated if they want. They're not going to get vaccinated if they don't want. And we're going to ride this baby out with more people getting really sick, more people dying, and continuing impact on our economy and our social life and our education. For example, um, in November 18th and 19th of this year, another survey was, uh, was done by the Pew Research. Only 60% of people said that they would get a vaccine for COVID if it was available today. 40%, 39% would not. Now, there is a little hope here. You know, I remember um, some of the estimates are that 70, 75, maybe 80% is necessary for herd immunity with COVID. Those are the current estimates for that. If we take this 39%, there are still around half of those who said, no, I still wouldn't get it. I don't care if new information comes out. I'm still not going to get it. Well, maybe half of them, they say, well, it's possible I would get the vaccine. These are the people that we want to influence. The dyed-in-the-wool true anti-vaxxers, it's like any belief system. You know, we're probably not going to change them. It's the people who are riding the fence or have a, only a moderately strong opinion, those who are more amenable to new information. Those are the ones we really want to communicate with. But they think differently about this. One of the things that's really unique about anti-vaxxers, and it's probably true about, about um, uh, conspiracy theories as, as well, is that they look at a negative event even very rare events, and they over, overestimate the likelihood that it's going to occur. For example, there was an interesting study where uh, people were given a, uh, uh, 40 different causes from can of death, from cancer and animal bites, to childbirth and fireworks, flooding, car accidents, all kinds of stuff. And they asked them, how, how much do you estimate? What do you think the frequency of death is associated with those different causes? 
their averages were less accurate compared to actual statistics, and they tended to overestimate the risk of those things. So people we know are more swayed, again, by personal stories, by narratives, by anecdotal stories, and they blow them out of proportion, and they seek information that confirms that, because most people don't like to deal with, with inconsistency in their logic. Frankly, that's one of the things that characterizes most free thinkers. We're willing to entertain a variety of ideas and not prematurely close on it. I know some of us are, are really rigid about our free thinking, but at the same time, we tend to be more open-minded and critically thinking and skeptical of a lot of things uh, than other people do. But cognitive consistency is generally, as a human species, we like to have a lot more consistency in our ideas. Well, at Texas A&M, they did a study of about 1,300 U.S. adults. 36% of them believe they knew as much as or more than medical doctors and scientists about the cause of autism. Those who were most confident in what they knew had the least accurate information. They knew the least information. That's why I think this, this cartoon is pretty good. These smug pilots have lost touch with regular people like us. Who thinks I should fly the plane? And that's what they think. This is actually called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And the Dunning-Kruger effect says that people have very high confidence in what they know, but they also lack insight, they lack self-awareness, they, they lack humility, and they don't know what they don't know. And they ignore that. And so they continue to blunder ahead with the misinformation with high confidence. One of the things that we know is that politicians and therapists and physicians and teachers, if you have an air of confidence, even though you may be blathering on about something, people are going to accept that. Uh, years ago when I was teaching undergraduate classes, I found that students weren't asking questions about the things that I was lecturing on. And so I did a little experiment. And in one of my lectures uh, across three classes, I started saying the most weird stuff and people were still taking notes on it. And finally, I got a couple people who were looking up at me. I said, you're looking at me. Why are you doing that? I said, this isn't making sense. I don't know why you're saying that. He said, well, because I'm wondering how many people like you will question a professor. You need to do that. I could be telling you all kinds of crap, and you're writing it down. You should be thinking about the things that I'm telling you and other people are telling you. Unfortunately, that changed a lot of, a lot of people. But for the most part, if people are confident, they don't want to give up that prestige and that cognitive consistency. Well, the consequence of this stuff is that we're not going to make that herd immunity. And as a result, we're going to have more disabilities, death, trauma, and incredible costs. It delays our crisis response. It reinforces the polarity in politics. It undermines the trust we have in our governmental and our social institutions, in education, in science, and expertise. It reinforces the idea that I have rights. Forget the social responsibility stuff. But what's interesting in research where, we, where we, we talk with people like that, they actually feel less powerful because they don't have that certainty of the institutions. They feel more vulnerable and they're more easily led by these autocratic messages. What I'm concerned about is after Biden takes office, for example, What's going to happen with the Proud Boys? What's going to happen with these other people who are thinking, you know, this is a fraud who's in the White House now. These people who are pushing vaccines, or like the example that I think one of you brought up, did somebody intentionally um, misuse or leave out the, uh, the vaccine so that they couldn't be used? Uh, in a recent case, I heard that people got, what was it, four times the amount of vaccine that they should have. Is there, is there, is there intention involved in this stuff? to undermine the effectiveness of vac vaccine. The result of all of it is that it's going to prolong the pain that as a country we're going through and a loss of prestige and leadership in the world. So bottom line is we need to talk with people who maybe aren't the extremists, but the people who are sort of in between. Now, over the past probably four years, I've, I've been experimenting with this. I have a very good friend and colleague at the college. He's a very religious person. He's a very strong Republican. Uh, and we are the best of friends. Um, nearly every day, and even during COVID, we still get online um, uh, with Zoom once a week. But we get together every day over lunch or coffee, and we talk about stuff in the news. And we are polar op opposites in, in our beliefs. Uh, I'm pretty much an agnostic, uh, an atheist. 
Uh, I'm kind of I'm pretty much uh, left this with with moderation, and he is very right and very very religious. But what we would do is we would talk about our our belief about different things that have gone on, and he would ask me, and I would ask him, "How did you get to that belief? What what how do you think about that?" And we wouldn't be judgmental. We would listen, and that listening has brought us to respect each other. It's brought him a little bit more to the left. And frankly, on some issues, it's probably moved me a little bit more to the right. I understand how people think about that. That's what seems to be missing in our legislature, seems to be missing in our, our conversation. So what I'm emphasizing here is people are on a continuum regarding this. I, you know, pick your battles. And in those battles, be aware that when we try to challenge somebody, it's like somebody challenging us as free thinkers. You know, we're going to dig in our heels. We're going to fight back. That's not what we want to do. Probably the first thing is to say, you know, that's, that's an interesting position. Can you tell me more about that? And people are going to say, yeah, let me tell you about it. And as you draw them out and ask questions, if there are gaps in their knowledge, that'll become more apparent. If you're not attacking them, they're not going to defend that as much. They're going to be a little bit more, then they're going to say, well, how did you arrive at your, at your uh, uh, position? Well, let me tell you about that. And so it becomes more of a dialogue where as people, we begin to understand each other and not get so defensive. We can correct inf misinformation and say, you know, let's go online together and take a look at some of that stuff. Show, re tell realistic stories. We know that the anti-vaxxers hear these horror stories. Well, let me tell you a realistic story about what it's like for somebody with COVID because I have a friend or relative uh, who's had that, some who have gotten very sick. It's taken time off their jobs or businesses have closed down. You know, I'm a business guy. I want us to be out there and our economy to grow. We can't do this as long as this goes on. But, you know, to have those kinds of, of discussions. Also emphasizing nothing is 100% certain. If you have kids who are vaccinated, the bulk of the weight is to prevent their catching a disorder. There are going to be some allergic reactions, but that's true for anything. Not to have the vaccines gives almost a guarantee of larger numbers having a worse experience with that. We also need to put into our own words what we hear them saying so they can't claim, you know, I told you about this, but I don't think you understood what I'm saying. Well, let me tell you what I'm hearing you say. See if, if I'm really understanding it. Correct me if, if I'm not. We need to do more of that. We need to acknowledge that their information is based on, or that their beliefs are based on information they get. Let's go to those. You know, I'd, I'd like to see that stuff too. Um, but we know that information changes over time. Uh, um, the president has really battered Fauci because he said, in the beginning, masks don't work. You said that. Well, yeah, but as we get more information, we understand that they do work. They are better than not wearing a mask. And um, finding out uh, together. The other thing we need to do is to get more popular, prominent politicians and celebrities and other people who we know carries some impact and have them get out there and talk about vaccination and how important it is. Legal more difficult for people to opt out, make it mandatory. Now, that's, that's using law. That's forcing people. They don't like that. But personal privacy ends where public protection begins. And we pressure social media and social media platforms to restrict and keep correcting the anti-vax searches. The problem is that's going to drive people underground, and we can't control that as, as well either. So ultimately, I like this quote from Richard Feynman. Science is what we have learned about how to keep ourselves from fooling ourselves. And the real question is, how can we keep others from being fooled? 